Okay, so we want to look at, we want to find information, the scientific information or engineering information that's going to be useful in solving a particular problem or completing a certain model uh, or learning about a certain phenomena. Um, what I want is to find good scientific information. So this is 2021, so I could be uh, tempted. And here I'm going to share my screen so we can do it along. So I could be tempted to go to Google. And let's say I'm interested in how I test drive cars. So for example, if I want to test the fuel economy of a car um, and I want to get the best numbers, so I sell as, as many cars as I can. Um, well, one obvious trick is I could just test a car while I'm driving steadily downhill. And then I have this magic car that doesn't consume any fuel. So almost doesn't consume any fuel, except that's a pretty sleazy and pretty simple trick. And so we've thought about this one. So it turns out that there are standard driving patterns. So I have to drive the car, actually we do this on a, on a simulator, but we have to drive the car at certain speeds and often we'll impart a certain load on the car so that we simulate you know, different hills and so on. And then we, we drive this car on this simulated driving patterns, which is a standard. And then we can report the number for the fuel efficiency of the car in this particular representative driving pattern. Um, Okay, so I could be, uh, I want to search for this. So my first, this is 2021. Everybody knows Google is probably one of the best search engine generalist search engines out there. And so I'm gonna look for automotive uh, test drive pattern standards. I'm going to click this and then I'm going to get a whole bunch of uh, links and you know, some of them are globalfueleconomy.org. I don't know what that is. I get a lot of I get a lot of information. I get a Wikipedia page, which may or may not be of high enough quality. And even actually here, there's even a, a warning on this page. It, uh, it lists general references, but it's generally un, unverified because it doesn't cite the references in the right spots. So I may get some interesting information from the page, some general information about the Wikipedia page that's been distilled and condensed into something that's like an introduction of, of a book we would use for our ICE course, uh, but nothing of the uh, high scientific value. I could go down in the Wikipedia page right here, and there are references, and some of them are proper references. So something here like Transportation Research Part D, so this looks like, uh, this is actually doesn't look this, well, um, this is very likely a proper scientific journal. It is published by a publishing house Elsevier. Um, there are many, there are many, there are several high level publishing houses that uh, actually uh, are specialized in publishing scientific journals specifically. So they're publishers who buy up or create or help create scientific journals, which are run not by these companies directly, they are run by academics like me. They're, they're, they're people in universities or in businesses in, in engineering businesses or scientific uh, businesses or research centers who will work as editors and the editorial board that we call who uh, either request or they, they receive submissions uh, for articles. And then they do the work of uh, seeing if this particular scientific uh, paper is appropriate for um, for the um, is appropriate for uh, the scope of the journal that they're running, and then is it does it look like it's good enough? And then they send it out to external reviewers, people like me, who uh, are probably uh, just your standard researchers or standard academic researchers. And then these external reviewers then read this unpublished journal papers, and we comment on them. And so we criticize it, and then we look at how could it be improved. Is it a? Is it good? Is it sound? Does it follow standard scientific or accepted scientific principles and methods? Um, does it does the conclusions that it draw are actually uh, drawable or are they are they reachable from the methods that they've used in their paper? And so we go through all of these details and then suggest whether to actually publish it or reject it or improve it. So Elsevier is one of these large houses. Springer, which you may recognize from the cover of some of your textbooks, Springer is another large publisher. Um, that also has a wide array of, of uh, textbooks and scientific texts, but they also publish, they buy and publish a lot of scientific journals. Uh, SagePub is another one um, that publishes these, uh, these journals. And there's, so there's several names and then there are field specific names. We'll see some examples. So all that to say, we went to Google, we did a search, we get some information, but it's not 
necessarily it's not uh, uh, vetted high quality scientific information that I can really um, uh, rely on very, uh, very heavily. And that's because Google is a generalist search engine, right? If I, if I go back to the main page, these are, these are some of the suggestions that Google says about, you know, this, these are searches you may be interested in. And I don't know who Senator Lynn Bayak is. I think I, I did see on the news there that uh, she should somehow step down or she stepped down recently anyway. So these are, this is a generalist search engine. This is basically where you go if you want to find out if Billie Eilish got a new album. If you want to find scientific information, you go to Google Scholar. So scholar.google.ca, this is Google Scholar, stand on the shoulder of giants, stand on the shoulders of giants. So we are going to search scientific information that has been peer reviewed, that has been vetted, uh, and that has been criticized mostly by other researchers in the field uh, as being sound science. So where you can actually see I've tested this uh, video. So I want to search for automotive test driving patterns standards. And there we go. Now we get a much different set of results. Um, I get A, I can see, I get, well, first I have, a, a, I have a, an option to include patents or not. That's because Google Scholar searches in case law, patents, scientific journals, um, so uh, uh, proceedings of uh, conferences, high level proceedings. And so um, uh, Google Scholar actually returns proper I want to say proper, but high quality, criticized, peer reviewed scientific publications. So I see this first paper actually looks interesting. This is automotive test drive cycles for emission measurement and real world emissions levels, a review. So this is what we call a review paper, which is not necessarily new research, but it is a survey of actual research. Or when I say actual, I mean recent, recent um, or relevant research that has been done in a particular field about a particular question, and then it's aggregated to give an overview of what this field is like in this, in this case in or around 2002. Um, okay, so now I want to read this. There's, well, on the right here, I have a, a, a quick link. It says PDF ResearchGate. So I could go here, although I have to be careful. So ResearchGate is actually a social network. Uh, so scientists like myself, uh, graduate students, are encouraged to create an account. Uh, you can think of it as like the Facebook for science. And so I have an account there, although I, I seldom use it, I almost never use it. And so uh, you can, one of the, one of the um, I don't want to say main uses, but one uh, very big use of ResearchGate is that people will list their publications sort of as a, 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 a display of the work you've done. And then you can upload PDFs of your particular, of the particular publications you have, except you can upload anything. So one class of publications is like this one, uh, a review paper in a peer reviewed journal. Uh, another class of publications, which are completely valid publications, they're just not as, as uh, they're just, a, they, they serve a different purpose in academia and they're conference publications. So for example, I could have decided to go to a conference on automotive engineering and given a talk and for many many conferences in fact if not for most conferences all that's required to go and present at a conference is to submit like a, a one paragraph or a half page uh maybe a full page uh, summary of what you intend to present not the actual results just really a summary of what you intend to present and then the the, the people who run the conference will evaluate whether well this does this fit within the mandate of this conference basically are you likely to come in and actually meet people who are interested in the work. And if the answer is yes, and we think this work is, is reasonable, then uh, sure, we'll accept it. You can come and present at this conference. Um, and so you go and present at the conference and sometime just before or just after the conference, you'll um, one will submit a, a short paper or what we call an extended abstract. So it's two, three pages, five, six. It's a short, it's either a short paper or an extended summary of the work you presented at the conference except the summary and this extended abstract, uh, conference abstract are, are never almost, they're almost never peer reviewed. It's very seldom that they will actually be carefully peer reviewed. And so in this case, you end up with a publication which has not been looked over by your peers and deciphered and criticized whether your method is sound and your conclusions are correct. So this could be the value of this 
scientifically could be anywhere from zero to incredible. And so there is no there is no guarantee in that process that this information is uh, is scientifically sound. There could be mistakes in it. There could be fundamental mistakes in the method you've taken. So um, journal publications, on the other hand, when those are submitted, they go out to external reviewers and they get reviewed and nitpicked and criticized um, and, and then assessed. And those assessments, usually there's two, three, or, or usually two, three, or and sometimes a little bit more, maybe four reviewers that will comment on a paper. And this goes back to the journal, who then collates these and makes a decision whether to accept or or uh, or reject or require changes to a particular submission. So in the in the in the case of a, a peer reviewed journal publication, there is a bar that has been met where your work has been reviewed by other researchers. So I can have a lot more confidence that the information I'll find there is of high enough quality that I can rely on it and then move further in whatever I'm trying to do, right? whatever the design that I'm trying to make or uh, or the the research that I myself is trying I'm trying to achieve. Um, what was I going? Yes. So on ResearchGate, you can find anything. There's a wide variety. This is not, ResearchGate is not a journal. It's, uh, it's a social network for scientists. So I'm always a little bit wary. You have to look very carefully about what you're getting from ResearchGate. Just because it's from ResearchGate, it just means it comes from a scientist, but it doesn't mean that it's good. So in this particular case, and many times most of papers aren't available in ResearchGate. There's a, it's a gray area, whether it's legal to upload your papers to, uh, to such a place. And so often you won't have links. So for example, here's an IEEE um, publication, which there is no ResearchGate link. There is no uh, extraneous link that I can follow. So I'm gonna click the main link here and I should be, I should encounter, um, a really, yeah, I should encounter a, a sort of a, a blocking uh, situation. So in this case, I can see this is this is the title of the particular journal. Here are the authors, and I can probably, in this case, I can hover over, and I'm told that um, you know D. Mori is from Oxford Brookes University School of Engineering, and Austin is. They're both from the same school. Actually, they're all from this school. So this may be a student and his advisors and so on. Um, so I have all of this information. I see the abstract. So I see the summary of the work that is in there. So I can gauge whether I want to read the full paper, but I don't actually have access to the paper. Here it says access options. I could log in, but I don't, I don't have a sign-in name. Um, I can get institutional access or I could pay $40 for this paper for the single journal article. You don't pay for the article. So if you're a student at the university, uh, in this case, at Concordia University, the library already purchases subscriptions, often in bulk to many, many scientific journals, so that we can have as an institution access to these journals. This is what institutional access actually means. So in this particular case, how am I going to log in here? Well, um, and you sort of, it's kind of bizarre, you do this once or twice, and then your browser may remember that you're associated with a certain university and then actually try to authenticate you if you save your password, authenticate you directly through uh, sort of bypass um, this particular step. So I can go, so I want to read this paper. I'm going to go to library.concordia.ca. This is our library's website. And I'm going to use the Sophia discovery tool here. I'm just going to grab, there's actually two different uh, very useful items to grab. So the title should be unique. It most often is um, the title of the paper. And there's something here just below. You see here, this is this weird, this looks like a web address and it's formatted like a, a URL, like a, like a web link, but it actually is something called the DOI. And I forget exactly the, the uh, full detail of what DOI means, but it's an object identifier. I think it's digital object identifier. And so this string of numbers actually identify specifically this publication in this journal. Um, the problem is that our, our search tool is not that good. So I, uh, I prefer to, it's being improved all the time, but at this point, I prefer to use the title of the paper and just search for the title. And then the library, oh, this is taking just a minute. There we go. So now I have many, many, uh, uh, returns, but I see 
Aha, Proceedings of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, Part D, Journal of Automobile, Automobile Engineering. Uh, this is from 2002. So this is indeed the paper we have, and it says held by Concordia University Library, which means we have access to this journal. So I'm going to view the full text, and then it gives me a few options. I can request it from ProQuest. I usually just pick the first link, which in this case is from Sage, one of the large scientific journal publishers. I'm going to say view full text, and then I'm, I will be asked to sign into the library. So I'm going to use my uh, I'm going to use my net name and password. I'm going to sign in. And now that I've signed in, the university will redirect me to the publisher webpage. There we go. This is the exact, this is the same webpage I was at before. Actually, I think if I, yep. Except here, I hadn't been authenticated yet. You see these access options are all grayed out. And then in the new one here, it says that I have been identified as uh, having access through Concordia University. And now instead of an access option button, they have download PDF. There we go. And now I have access to the PDF from, uh, from this journal. So I can go and read this paper and determine, uh, oh, look at this. This is quite interesting. So ECE test drive cycle. So this is speed versus time in seconds. So this tells me uh, I have to drive my car. I think it's on flat. So I have to drive the car at these intervals of speed. So I have to ramp up to what looks like 10, 10, 15 kilometers per hour for a few seconds and then stop. And then I have to go up to 30 kilometers per hour and then ramp down and ramp up to 55, down to 40 or 35, down to zero up. So this is like city driving. We're starting, we're stopping and so on. So this is a test drive pattern. That's right, part one city. Part two, this is uh, driving patterns on the freeway. So this is meant to replicate how a car is actually used. Awesome. Here's the EPA. This is the federal test procedure. Um, that's right. So cold start phase, transient phase, hot start phase. So there's different phases to represent different parts of using this, um, using the using a particular vehicle. So this is supposed to be representative of usage. So that my testing is then representative of how the car will behave in the real world. There's two questions I want to answer before I end this video. So one is, how do I know this is reputable? Uh, this, how do I know that this is a, a, a reputable source of information? Anybody can call themselves a journal after all. And then two is, how do I tell people that I'm using data from this, from this particular journal? OK, or from this, I shouldn't say journal, from this particular paper. OK. So how do I know that this is reputable? Um, let me just go back. So here is the page from uh, the publish the yes, the publisher. So from the journal, this is the, the page that identifies the article. And this is the name of the journal in which it's published, Proceedings of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, Part D, Journal of Automobile Engineering. And this sounds uh, a bit pompous and antiquated. So it actually gives me a bit of, uh, uh, it gives me some, uh, um, uh, it gives me some a good feeling because academia is pretty pompous and antiquated. So titles usually look like this. Um, and this is also published by Sage Journals. So Sage Pub, Sage Publications is one of the large publishers of uh, scientific journals. There are others, uh, for example, uh, Elsevier, I think I've talked about Springer um, is another large publisher of scientific journals. So these are publishers that either buy individual journals or they help start individual journals. And then they don't run the journals day to day, but they provide tools to, uh, they provide tools to the, um, they provide tools to the people who actually run uh, the journals so that they can go through with the publication. So these, this involves websites like this one. This also involves uh, tools for a peer review, for example, so different platforms. So you can automatically invite external reviewers and handle all of the reviewing. It also involves uh, um, actually transforming the, the, the submission into a formatted, consistent PDF that can be published and so on, and then handling all of the print publication. So, um, okay, so now this is the, so this is from Sage, which is one of the big ones that I, I know I have, this raises my level of confidence. Sage Elsevier, uh, um, Sage Elsevier Springer, K 
Cambridge University Press. Uh, there are these are sort of the big names in the academic world. Now, it's obvious it's it's normal for a student or, or beginning graduate student to not be as familiar with those names. And even if you're familiar, there are still some pretty bad journals uh, held by these companies. So how do I get another check that these journals to, that they passed the sniff test? If I've never seen proceedings of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers journal, so if, the, if I've never seen this particular journal, it has to pass a sniff test that I, I believe that this is um, that this is a, a, a reputable, a, a, you know, a minimum, it passes a minimum bar of reputability that I'm confident that the papers in there are actually, uh, I want to say real or actually like minimally good. So in other ways, I'm going to go to the journal information. So here I have different you know, journal home, browse journal, and I can see journal information, which gives me a lot of information about the actual scientific journal itself. It has its description. Here I could go and read this. This is going to tell me most likely, um, oh, there we go. So this is telling me it's a leading, well, this is obviously we're going to promote our own journal, but it's a leading international journal serving the automotive industry. And uh, we accept contributions on aspects of vehicle engineering, including such and such. I can go to aims and scope. I should have a slightly more detailed uh, description of the different topics included in this journal. So if I'm interested in engines and fuels, structures, mechanisms, and so on, so lubrication. So if, if those aspects of automobile engineering interest me, well, you may well find them in this journal. Then I'm going to go to the editorial board. And I'm going to look at, so these are the, so Sage Publishing publishes the journal itself. So they give it all the tools and they give it the space and they handle the printing. But the editorial board, these are the people handling the day-to-day -day activities. So they're the ones that are receiving, uh, they're receiving the publications or the, the submissions. They're finding external reviewers, dispatching to get reviews. They're analyzing these submissions to see, do they, do they fit within the mandate and the scope of our journal? And so I want to see who are these people. And right away in this particular case, I recognize uh, some big names, right? So the Packard Technical Center, I think is an industry center that does research on automobile, automobile engineering. Then I see the University of Leeds. These are the so associate editors are usually uh, assigned or they're, they're responsible for a particular topic within the journal. And so I see the University of Leeds, University of Alaska Fairbanks. It's not as, it's not as big a name as, as Leeds, but it's still, it is a proper university. It's not what we'd call a diploma mill. It's not a place where you simply pay and then receive a degree. It's not a fraudulent activity. It is a proper university where students go to study and research and learn. Um, Simon Fraser is also a well-known Canadian university. Clemson University is also a smaller but still well-known, uh, internationally well-known university. And then I see the editorial board. Um, and then I have, you know, can I get what? So I'm not familiar with all of these institutes, but I do recognize some good names. The University of Illinois is actually my alma mater. This is where I got my PhD. The Indian Institute of Technology, uh, the Technische Universität München. This is the Munich Institute of Technology. Uh, I know this university, the University of Cambridge, again, Clemson. And I see a lot of, A, I see a lot of names of very reputable universities. I see a lot of diversity. Not everybody is from the same institute or from the same research center, which would be a little bit of a, a telltale sign that this this journal is sort of meant for people to like sort of self-publish uh, their own publications and increase their publication count. But in this case, the editorial board has a wide variety of people coming from a very large number of universities. Uh, you do have to be you do have to be careful. There are what we call predatory publishers out there and predatory publications, and those are journals where there will not be a check on the quality of a publication. You simply pay $300, $400, $500 along with your, uh, with your submission, and it gets published right away without, uh, in, in the most fraudulent cases, it gets published right away without any peer review or anything. Um, so in this particular case, I'm looking at the editorial board, and I, I get a good feeling. I see household names, I see large universities, and I, I could even check some. So here's Purdue University. So if I check, it'd be good to have a link to their bio, but if I look here at who is this person, 
And I can see Gregory Shaver from Purdue, and this is from the Purdue University. And let's see, what is his field of study? Ah, there we go. Model-based systems and control design of commercial vehicle powertrains, connected and automated commercial vehicles. So this is, this is actually somebody who works in uh, uh, vehicle engineering. So believe it or not, some of these predatory publications will simply put people's names on their editorial board without checking. So actually, I would look, this is this person's page from Purdue. And then I would look at, um, I've just, I hadn't looked at his page before, but somewhere I would expect him to list uh, in his uh, different uh, capacities, he would probably list somewhere that, um, here's his personal webpage, maybe it's on here, he would probably list that he is one of the associate editors uh, for this journal. <coughs> Excuse me. So now if we look, I'm just, I'm gonna stop, but I have a pretty good feeling that this paper is a good paper, but if I looked on his resume, I could find that um, education areas, publications. So I can go and look and to get a better idea and I could do this for all the editorial board. So it's normal as a student, as a beginning graduate student to not be uh, familiar with all of these people, but there's, uh, so it takes a longer time to get confidence that a paper is actually reputable, but as you very quickly as one searches, you will find uh, that you can recognize these more faster and faster. Um, okay, so that was the first question is how do I pass the sniff test? Well, I have to look at who publishes the journal, uh, so that the household name that owns the publication, um, um, who are, uh, what is the aim and the scope of this journal? Is it even remotely, uh, is it even remotely, um, uh, how do we say, related to the topic of the paper itself? Uh, and then I want to look at the editorial board and get a feeling for, oh yes, this particular journal is in fact uh, reputable, uh, or it seems like it's a real journal run uh, by people. And then if you look at, I have now, um, oh, I just want to look to get back my, my Google Scholar list. You will find some, especially in the automotive engineering. So you'll find, um, for example, here there's often, you know, ASME is the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Uh, this is normally reputable publications. Here's Energy Fund Policy from Elsa, published by Severe. Here's Springer, uh, the International Journal of Automotive Technology. So you'll find some, um, um, sort of household names, and I'm actually looking for, I don't have one in this uh, search results, but often you'll find SAE papers, and SAE is the Society of Automotive Engineering, or Society of Automotive Engineers. Um, these are actually usually quite costly, and I think we, we don't have access to them through the university, but those are usually very, uh, they're usually uh, medium to very high quality publications. Okay, so the first part was, does this paper pass uh, the sniff test, and the answer is, or this journal passes a sniff test. Now I'm going to read the paper and make a mind for myself. Is this good? So I find some information that I want to use. I find the actual description of uh, of those standard driving patterns. I want to use this in uh, in my research. I want to use this in my uh, in my project. How do I tell people that I have used this paper? So here I'm going to say. Um, so I'm going to open. There you go. So I'm going to open. This is. LibreOffice can think of this as words. So I'm starting to write my paper. Um, there are several. Uh, there are several standardized driving patterns used for testing and performance reporting. It's not a very good sentence, but it's a sentence. Okay. Now I want to put a reference. One or reference one. Okay, and then I'm going to have so reference when it's here. Now I want to reference this paper. I could do this. Oh, where is my? There we go. So I could do this. Oh, my paper. After all, this is 2021. A web link is good, right? Except it is not, because and it's it doesn't happen every day, but it does happen that journals get bought and sold, and these. Uh, these web links are going to go out of date. For example, if the, if this particular paper or these proceedings are bought by Elsevier, they're never they're not going to be uh, 
held by SagePub. And then the, the web link will change. Um, in addition, I've made a big mistake is that you can see this is not actually a web link that leads me to a SagePub page. This is a web link that leads me to what we call a proxy from Concordia.ca. So this actually points to a computer that authenticates me as a Concordia, in my case, as a Concordia staff, saying that I have access to this paper. And then it redirects me to the journal. So this is not even the link to the actual journal. So I've made a big, big mistake. So we don't just give a web link. As I've said, academic academics and academic science is pretty old school. So I want, actually, I'm going to keep this here. So I want to, uh, when I want to cite, I want to give all of the defining elements of the paper that will uh, allow anybody to find it. And those are usually the authors, the name, uh, that the authors, the title, the name of the journal, the publication date, and the month and year or the year, the pages in, um, in the actual issue. So I could give the volume and the issue in which they appeared. And this looks weird because what I got is a PDF, right? But if we look carefully, there should be, yep, there are page numbers. You know, this is actually page 559. So this was, if not published, this was virtually published. Even if it wasn't printed, it was virtually published in an issue. There is a book that corresponds to this. And this paper is on page 555 of this particular book. So how would I, um, sorry, I'm just trying to find back the page. Oh. I think it was from, I left it from here. So I'm just going to go back to the page that identifies the paper. So I want to get all of that information. And there are, there we go. So this is the page that identifies this particular paper. And I could go to article information. And there you go. You see it's in this particular journal. Think of the journal as a periodical. It's like X-Men, you know, X-Men Rise of the Silver Surfer. Well, this is volume 216, issue 7, pages 555 to 564. And it was published on July 1st, 2002. That's when that particular issue came out. And we all read it excitedly to see what happened in the adventures of emission measurement. So these are the authors and their affiliation. So this is sort of the basic defining information that tells me where I can find this particular paper. There's an almost a near infinite number of ways to arrange that information. There is a quick shorthand. So there's almost, yeah, there are almost an infinite number of ways to arrange that information. Um, so for example, if I go, this is the Google search that we did way at the beginning. If I come here, I see these little quotes, the, the little quote sign, and this is to cite. So if I click here, Google Scholar actually has um, pre-made, it has the, the, this is how the citations or the bibliographic entries would look like in sort of five very common standard styles. So if I want to use, for example, the Vancouver citation format, I could come here, copy, and then I'm going to go into my document, paste this here. And now I have a citation. Uh, it's nice to stay consistent uh, and always use the same format. There, um, there are a couple of things of, I kind of dislike uh, the Google Scholar tool for one particular reason um, is that science and academia, academia is very, very old school, uh, but we do evolve with the times. And one of the things that, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that is not included that we tend to just add to cite to any citation style now is the DOI. So this object identifier, which points me directly to a specific paper inside a specific journal, you can see it here, it's embedded inside this uh, web address, it goes to the proxy and so on. It's this. This is the DOI. And so I like to add, you can, there are different ways to do this. So DOI colon blah. This is the DOI, the, the identifier of this particular paper, because it is indeed much faster once you have the DOI. Modern tools do understand this. So if I go back to Google Scholar and I just paste the DOI, it should pull out just this, just this journal in one go. So the DOI is extremely useful. It doesn't mean that you should put just a DOI because when I'm reading your paper, if all I see, if I see a citation like this, 
but I have no idea what that is. I don't know if it's a, a, a book or if it's a, well, actually DOIs are for journal publications specifically. So I know this is most likely from a journal looking thing, but I have no idea. This could be a made up journal. This could be a made up number of strings. There could be, it's easy to make a mistake if one of, in one of these. So it's not very, uh, it's not very resistant to, uh, to typos. And that also means that I have to go and look. I have to go and search every reference in your document to find where it comes from. So this, a DOI is not a reference. A reference is the author list, the name of the publication of the actual uh, paper, the name of the publication, the journal or the proceedings, the publication year, this or the publication date, and then the this is the you see volume and issue, and the page number, and then I like to add the DOI. I've said that there's hundreds, hundreds upon hundreds of of uh, formats. So here I'm going to search, for example, uh, automatic citation formatting. Oh, there was a good one. Uh, formatting generator. And I'm pretty sure that, oh, citation machine.net. Ah, this one's an account. Okay. But you could find, oh, I've, I've forgotten exactly, but you could find a, a here's easy bib. So you can find a website that will automatically, so if I put in, sorry, this is what happens while well, everybody wants to make you pay. So this is what happens when you try to uh, try to do a, a, a demo in um, in uh, live. So actually here I can pull up, I can pull up a tool that I use in my research to classify papers. So here, let me go up, uh, let me pick, whatever it is. So here's in, there you go, flammability limits. So here are a bunch of papers. So this is a, this is my own personal uh, research database. I contains papers. And so if I open this, oh, this opens a particular paper. But if I, if I go and right click and I say, create bibliography from item, this particular software asks me for what style do I want to cite in? And this is much more already than the five that Google gives me. We recognize the Vancouver, there's the Nature, so Nature papers use their own citation style and so on. There are almost as many citation styles as scientists. So, and I can add more, I can manage styles and keep adding. So as you can imagine, there are hundreds upon hundreds of citation styles. So you want to be consistent and check with the university which particular citation style is it that we're supposed to use. And that sort of that sort of covers. So now in our report, I would not use this link. I would not use just a DOI. This is how I cite proper scientific information. Thank you and good luck.